All right, thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. So don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell for notifications of new videos going up, which is quite frequently. And, of course, upvote the video itself. I'm here with Stuart Patrick, and I am really fired up about this. And that 97 team, that 96 team, that's kind of my wheelhouse. I was just out of high school. I'm really paying attention to what was going on. The NCAA tried to blow Ole Miss up in the mid-90s. Um, I talked to Todd yeah. Wade about that. But I'm here with Stuart Patridge, um, who took the 97 team as, and was the quarterback of the team that kind of brought Ole Miss back. How you doing, Stuart? I'm doing good. I appreciate you having me, Stephen. Yeah, no problem. Like I, like I was saying, that's kind of my wheelhouse and everything. And I guess we're going to start out. Let's just start off with the Mississippi State game. Talk a little bit about that game. There's so much happened that day that ended right. that way, that began that way. Talk a little bit about that game. I can tell you exactly how it started, kind of from the, from the getting up in the hotel that morning. If you recall, the year before, it had just flooded, it was raining, terrible. Of course, anytime you're playing quarterback, you want conditions to be perfect. You know, <laughs> so at 70, and I remember looking out the window, and it was cloud and drizzle, and I was thinking, oh, goodness gracious, we're going to have another, uh, another monsoon. But the weather held off. Of course, we get to the uh, stadium getting taped up. And, of course, you know, everybody knows about the incident that happened before the game. But the funny part about that, from, from my perspective uh, and the quarterback's perspective, uh, the skill guys come out first to warm up. So, you know, catch punts. We throw the receivers, running backs, practice handoff. And we just have a couple of our big guys to tight ends. So we don't have our line and everybody else. And I remember I was, uh, I was facing – uh, the locker room where players run out, and so uh, I see I see a couple of their kind of groups of their players coming around, and they had most of their big guys out there already. The way they did warm ups, and I'll never forget I'm throwing the ball, and they're kind of running on the outside of the field, and I see that whole pack just start sprinting. I remember thinking to myself. Oh hell, they're fired up to play today. And about that time, I hear some rant and raving, and I turn around. They were running to get into the fight, and so you turn, you know, you turn around, and uh, I see John Avery, and they're kind of got him. Of course, you know, it's one thing about it. When you're a 200 pounder, you're not going to do anything against you know 300 pound guys in, in equipment. So other than just trying to get out of the way, uh, so I mean that was now that's a heck of a way to start a game, and of course. Everybody's already on the field, and there's not really any uh, way to break it up, so to speak. And so, you know, it was a crazy way to start the, the game. You know, emotions are always high in the Egg Bowl. Uh, but also, that that game, uh, State was number 15th in the country. They were seven and three. You know, you didn't have as many bowl games, so there was a lot riding. You know, not only as bragging rights <laughs> for the state, you know, uh, you know, a lot of opportunity uh, with whoever won the football game. Talk, talk me a little bit through that last drive. You, you, if I remember correctly, you guys scored first and took a seven nothing lead, and then Mississippi State kind of slowly that's, got control of the game. That's right. Uh, what had happened, you know, Joe Lee Dunn, uh, who had actually been the interim head coach my first year at Ole Miss. Uh, known for his blitzing great defenses, uh, putting pressure on the quarterback. Uh, and, I, you know, we, we were really playing good at that point in the season, the line playing great, receivers picking up blitzes. And so the first three plays of the game, uh, they had blitzed. We had one big play and then a play that uh, me and uh, Corey Pitcher just missed on that was a bit blitz play. And the actual touchdown – was a, a checkoff uh, and got Andre to run a little uh, skinny post on the blitz and scored a touchdown. And so from that series, they they never blitzed again until the until the last <laughs> drive. So what had happened? They just started rushing three, uh, dropping eight, and so it kind of got stalemated there to the end. Uh, and so when they missed that field goal and we had a chance to get the ball back, you know. It's like when you're a kid growing up, you know, you're, you're always playing in the backyard. It's the waning seconds, you know, for the touchdown. But, you know, we had some guys that really made uh, big plays, the whole team. That's one thing about offense, to be successful. Everybody's got to do, do their job. But, uh, they, and so we get down to the uh, 
you know, inside their 20. And what happens again? Jolie Dunn blitzes again. First time he'd blitzed since the first quarter. Uh, check off. Andre Rohn catches the touchdown pass. Hmm. You know, so then we go over to the sideline. Everybody's excited. Uh, and, you know, trying to decide whether to go for one or two. Uh, you know, thank goodness Senator Tuberville now <laughs> uh, decided to go uh, for two. And what's so crazy, uh, uh, the first person I was going to look at was Andre because he had the best opportunity because he's a slot guy. He's off He's off the ball, so his chances to, to make a move, they clearly were going to blitz again. Well, he gets held at the line of scrimmage. Uh, I turn around to throw it to Corey Peterson. I'm just hoping he's going to be somewhere because you can't see anything. <laughs> and it, uh, I, I wish I had this uh, tape. We have what's called the end zone cuts. They're, you know, the sideline is what most people see. You know, when watching TV, but the end zone cuts shows you at ground level the lineman. And mm. You can see Matt Luke blocking his guy, and then uh, that big defensive tackle Eric Dotson splits it. Kind of sticks the old foot out there, and the ball misses his hand just by I mean an <laughs> inch. Uh, you know, Corey hit it, uh, you know, caught it and hit the ground. So uh, it was exciting, exciting time. Well, whenever you all threw that, um, that slant pattern and everything, was that practice that you threw it hard and low like that? Uh, well, I can say we've never had a – we never practiced where it looked like that. To be honest, I mean, he just – he was – you know, Corey was a good-sized guy for a receiver, and I was hoping that he'd, he'd bodied up on the – the guy, which is exactly what he did, and you know, just you know, time and you, you, you practice, you know, uh, you know, connecting to the so much in practice that it becomes second nature that you should almost be able to do it, you know, with your eyes closed. Sometimes your eyes are closed, it seems like, but uh, you know, it worked out great. I told him, you know, we're like a, a couple of old fishermen, uh, you know, the older we get, the better we work, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Okay, so over the years, over the last 20 years, 25 years, um, the legend of John Avery has grown. How fast was John? Uh, He was unbelievable. Uh, The first day, uh, the first time I'd heard about John Avery, uh, I played at Mississippi Delta Community College before I came to Ole Miss. Uh, And we had, we'd won a national championship, and we had a guy on our defense by the name of Deron Bowden, who played 14 years in the NFL. To that point, that was the fastest man I'd seen in person. He never lost a race in the 200 meters in Florida. I mean, he was legit, world-class speed. <laughs> and by, and I go to Ole Miss the following year. My dad and brother go to see uh, Mississippi Delta play Northwest. My dad goes, Northwest has got this guy. I've never seen anybody like this. He goes, Deron Bolden had the angle, and John Avery runs right by him. So Avery gets to practice the first time. And we're in shells. And he made about two moves. And of course, I'm getting to see it as a spectator because I've handed off. And it goes from just off the tackle all the way. Almost everybody on the defense misses him. And he leaves everybody like to stand and steal. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, that's a different kind of, uh, that's a totally different kind of speed there. I mean, when it's that evident, of, you know, when everybody can run out there. So, Body impressive. Yeah, it shows how um, good and how fast John Avery was because the guy who was backing him up is probably the undoubted uh-huh. best running back in the history of all this football. You were pretty blessed, man. Yeah, I was very blessed. <laughs> Two first rounders. Uh, back, always makes life a lot easier for a quarterback. And of course, unfortunately, John, uh, we played Central Florida our first game of uh, senior year and he dislocates his elbow. Uh, on a sweep around the end. So then, uh, you know, he doesn't get to play, but who steps up? Some freshmen that we were, you know, in two days, they were trying to decide uh, Coach Kaufman and Coach Mazzoni were arguing on whether he's going to play linebacker or running back. I'm glad Coach Mazzoni, uh, you know, won out on that. So. All right. Um, let's go back to 96 a little bit. Um, T- Coach Tuberville had this weird thing with quarterbacks, and he did it in, in 95 as well. Josh Nelson was the guy, then Paul Head took over at the end, and then Paul Head took over the start. And then I went to that LSU game, that, that fateful LSU game right before that. Um, that was the only time I think Tuberville wore blue. Um, 
And coming out against Georgia, they start this kid, Stuart Patridge, um, Juco transfer, and you just kind of own Athens. Talk a little bit about that game, how, that the built-up to it, when did you find out, all that stuff. Uh, uh, well, they let me know, you know earlier in the week. And of course, I had been getting to play kind of like what you were talking about. Hmm. Uh, Coach Tuberville, that had kind of become his MO at that point in time. Kind of, I don't know if he was doing it because it seemed like a competitive thing to do or because Spurrier used to do it. Hmm. Uh, and so, uh, coming into that week, I felt good that the, our whole junior year, we never had one game that the same five linemen started. when We were just decimated by injury. So, you know, uh, just trying to get in sync, whether it be with the running game, passing game, that was tough. But I'll say the Georgia game, our, our line played great. Everybody, the, the game plan was great. Everybody seemed to, to come together. Uh, and of course, I think that was the first game since we spoke earlier. We've been on probation. We've not been able to be on any TV. That was going to be our first game on TV. So, uh, you know, it was an exciting game uh, all the way to the end, for sure. Always fun to talk to Stuart Patridge. You know, when Chris Partridge, we talk about him, and I'm going to talk about him over and over again, I always try to prevent myself from saying Patridge because that's what my mind automatically goes to. It's unbelievably cool to talk to Stuart and thank him for his time. Anyway, that'll do it for the show today. I do want to let you know that you can get more on the SEC by making Locked On SEC your second listen every day. Host Chris Gordy and the local experts of Locked On take you across the SEC in 30 minutes. Make Locked On your second listen every day. Locked On SEC. Anyway, that'll do it for today. We'll see you tomorrow.